Padua was born at Lisbon in the year 1195 of noble, powerful and God-fearing parents and received in baptism the name of Ferdinand. Having been educated in the cathedral school, Ferdinand, at the age of 15, joined the canons regular of St. Augustine, in the convent of St. Vincent, just outside the city walls. Two years later, he betook himself with permission of his superior to the convent of Santa Croce in Coimbra, where he remained for eight years, occupying his time mainly with study and prayer. Gifted with an excellent understanding and a prodigious memory, he soon gathered from the sacred scriptures and the writings of the Holy Fathers a treasure of theological knowledge. In the year 1220, having seen conveyed into the church of Santa Croce the bodies of the first Franciscan martyrs, who had suffered death at Morocco, January 16 of the same year, he resolved to become a friar minor, that he might preach the faith to the Saracens. Having confided his intention to some of the brethren of the convent of Olivares, near Coimbra, who came to beg alms at the abbey of the canons regular, he received from their hands the Franciscan habit in the same convent of Santa Croce. Thus Ferdinand left the canons regular of St. Augustine to join the order of Friars Minor, taking at the same time the new name of Anthony, a name which later on the convent of Olivares also adopted. A short time after his entry into the order, Anthony started for Morocco, but, stricken down by a severe illness, which affected him the entire winter, he was compelled to sail for Portugal the following spring, 1221. His ship, however, was overtaken by a violent storm and driven upon the coast of Sicily, where Anthony then remained for some time, till he had regained his health. Having heard meanwhile from the Brethren of Messina that a general chapter was to be held at Assisi, May 30th, he journeyed thither, arriving in time to take part in it. The chapter over, Anthony remained entirely unnoticed. He said not a word of his studies, writes his earliest biographer, nor of the services he had performed. His only desire was to follow Jesus Christ and him crucified. Accordingly, he applied to Father Graziano, provincial of Coimbra, for a place where he could live in solitude and penance, and enter more fully into the spirit and discipline of Franciscan life. While Anthony lived retired at Monte Paolo, it happened, one day, that a number of Franciscan and Dominican friars were sent together to Forli for ordination. Anthony was also present, but simply as companion of the provincial. When the time for ordination had arrived, it was found that no one had been appointed to preach. The superior turned first to the Dominicans, and asked that one of their number should address a few words to the assembled brethren. But everyone declined, saying he was not prepared. In their emergency they then chose Anthony, and commanded him to speak whatever the Spirit of God might put into his mouth. Anthony, compelled by obedience, spoke at first slowly, but soon enkindled with fervor, he began to explain the most hidden sense of Holy Scripture with such profound erudition and sublime doctrine that all were struck with astonishment. With that moment began Anthony's public career. Saint Francis, informed of his learning, directed him to teach theology to the brethren. By studying his works, we can form for ourselves a sufficient idea of the character of his doctrine. A doctrine, namely, which, leaving aside all arid speculation, prefers an entirely seraphic character, corresponding to the spirit and ideal of St. Francis. It was as an orator, however, rather than as professor, that Anthony reaped his richest harvest. He possessed in an eminent degree all the good qualities that characterize an eloquent preacher. A loud and clear voice, a winning countenance, wonderful memory, and profound learning, to which were added from on high the spirit of prophecy and an extraordinary gift of miracles. With the zeal of an apostle he undertook to reform the morality of his time by combating in an especial manner the vices of luxury, avarice, and tyranny. 
The fruit of his sermons was, therefore, as admirable as his eloquence itself. No less fervent was he in the extinction of heresy, notably that of the Cathares and the Paterines, which infested the center and north of Italy, and probably also that of the Albigenses in the south of France, though we have no authorized documents to that effect. Among the many miracles St. Anthony wrought, the three most noted recorded by his biographers are the following. The first is that of a horse, which, kept fasting for three days, refused the oats placed before him, till he had knelt down and adored the blessed sacrament, which St. Anthony held in his hands. The second most important miracle is that of the poisoned food offered him by some Italian heretics, which he rendered innoxious by the sign of the cross. The third miracle worthy of mention is that of the famous sermon to the fishes on the bank of the river Brenta in the neighborhood of Padua. The zeal with which St. Anthony fought against heresy, and the great and numerous conversions he made rendered him worthy of the glorious title, Hammer of the Heretics. Though his preaching was always seasoned with the salt of discretion, nevertheless he spoke openly to all, to the rich as to the poor, to the people as well as those in authority. In a synod at Borges in the presence of many prelates, he reproved an archbishop so severely that he induced him to sincere amendment. After having been guardian, we find Anthony in the year 1226, Custos Provincial in the province of Limousine. The most authentic miracles of that period are the following. Preaching one night on Holy Thursday in the church of Saint Pierre du Queriox at Limoges, he remembered he had to sing a lesson of the divine office. Interrupting suddenly his discourse, he appeared at the same moment among the friars in choir to sing his lesson, after which he continued his sermon. Another day preaching in the square, he miraculously preserved his audience from the rain. At St. Junin during the sermon, he predicted that by an artifice of the devil the pulpit would break down, but that all should remain safe and sound. And so it occurred, for while he was preaching, the pulpit was overthrown, but no one hurt, not even the saint himself. Likewise, by breathing on the face of a novice, whom he had himself received into the order, he confirmed him in his vocation. At Breve, where he had founded a convent, he preserved from the rain the maidservant of a benefactress who was bringing some vegetables to the brethren for their meager repast. After the death of St. Francis, October 3, 1226, Anthony returned to Italy. His way led him through La Provence on which occasion he wrought the following miracle. Fatigued by the journey, he and his companion entered the house of a poor woman, who placed bread and wine before them. She had forgotten, however, to shut off the tap of the wine barrel, and to add to this misfortune, the saint's companion broke his glass. Anthony began to pray, and suddenly the glass was made whole, and the barrel filled anew with wine. Shortly after his return to Italy, Anthony was elected minister provincial of Emilia. But in order to devote more time to preaching, he resigned this office at the general chapter of Assisi, May 30, 1230, and retired to the convent of Padua, which he had himself founded. The last Lent he preached was that of 1231. The crowd of people which came from all parts to hear him, frequently numbered 30,000 and more. His last sermons were principally directed against hatred and enmity, and his efforts were crowned with wonderful success. Permanent reconciliations were effected, peace and concord re-established, liberty given to debtors and other prisoners, restitutions made, and enormous scandals repaired. In fact, the priests of Padua were no longer sufficient for the number of penitents, and many of these declared they had been warned by celestial visions and sent to St. Anthony, to be guided by his counsel. Others after his death said that he appeared to them in their slumbers, admonishing them to go to confession. At Padua also took place the famous miracle of the amputated foot, 
which Franciscan writers attribute to Saint Anthony. A young man, in a fit of anger, kicked his own mother. Repentant, he confessed his fault to Saint Anthony who said to him, The foot of him who kicks his mother deserves to be cut off. The young man ran home and cut off his foot. Learning of this, Saint Anthony took the amputated member of the unfortunate youth and miraculously rejoined it. Through the exertions of Saint Anthony, the municipality of Padua, March 15, 1231, passed a law in favor of debtors who could not pay their debts. A copy of this law is still preserved in the Museum of Padua. From this, as well as the following occurrence, the civil and religious importance of the saint's influence in the 13th century is easily understood. In 1230, while war raged in Lombardy, Saint Anthony betook himself to solicit the liberty of the prisoners. An apocryphal legend relates that the tyrant humbled himself before the saint and granted his request. This is not the case, but what does it matter, even if he failed in his attempt? He nevertheless jeopardized his own life for the sake of those oppressed by tyranny, and thereby showed his love and sympathy for the people. Thus, the triumph of St. Anthony's missionary career manifests itself not only in his holiness and his numerous miracles, but also in the popularity and subject matter of his sermons, since he had to fight against the three most obstinate vices of luxury, avarice, and tyranny. At the end of Lent, 1231, Anthony retired to Campo San Piero, in the neighborhood of Padua, where, after a short time he was taken with a severe illness. Transferred to Vercelli, and strengthened by the apparition of our Lord, he died at the age of 36 years, on June 13, 1231. He had lived 15 years with his parents, 10 years as a canon regular of St. Augustine, and 11 years in the order of Friars Minor. Immediately after his death he appeared at Vercelli to the abbot, Thomas Gallo, and his death was also announced to the citizens of Padua by a troop of children, crying, The Holy Father is dead, Saint Anthony is dead. Gregory IX, firmly persuaded of his sanctity by the numerous miracles he had wrought, inscribed him within a year of his death in the calendar of saints of the Cathedral of Spoleto. In the Bull of Canonization he declared he had personally known the saint, and we know that the same pontiff has heard one of his sermons at Rome and was astonished at his profound knowledge of the Holy Scriptures. The name of Anthony became celebrated throughout the world, and with it the name of Padua. The inhabitants of that city erected to his memory a magnificent temple, whither his precious relics were transferred in 1263, in presence of Saint Bonaventure, Minister General at the time. When the vault in which for thirty years his sacred body had reposed was opened, the flesh was found reduced to dust, but the tongue uninjured, fresh, and of a lively red color. Saint Bonaventure, beholding this wonder, took the tongue affectionately in his hands, exclaiming, O blessed tongue that always praised the Lord, and made others bless him, now it is evident what great merit thou hast before God. The fame of Saint Anthony's miracles has never diminished, and even at the present day he is acknowledged as the greatest thaumaturgist of the times. He is especially invoked for the recovery of things lost. In the year 1946, Saint Anthony of Padua was proclaimed by Pope Pius XII a doctor of the Church. Saint Anthony of Padua, please pray for us. Saint Francis of Assisi, please pray for us. O Mary, Queen of Heaven, please pray for us. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now, and at the hour of our death, Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, 
world without end. Amen. Thank you for watching. If you have enjoyed this video, please do like this video and share this video with others. God bless you and have a great day.